Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this capstone of what has been a truly outstanding celebration of 100 years of aerospace at MIT. I'll be brief, as I'm certain that you didn't come here to listen to me. <laughs> but before I start, I want to reflect briefly on the significance of this week's symposium. Over the last few days, we have welcomed to our campus a who's who of aerospace scholars, innovators, and legends. More than 500 alumni and guests from all over the world have joined us to honor the past century of aerospace achievement and MIT's central role in the development of earth transportation. This celebration has also provided an opportunity to look ahead, to imagine, for instance, what the rise of autonomous systems will mean for earth travel, commerce, and space exploration. And it's breathtaking, truly, to recognize and realize the magnitude of the impact that the faculty, students, staff, and alumni of this department have had on earth travel. As I look around at the aerospace pioneers who have taken the time to join us this, to these events this week, the thought that keeps coming back to mind is the realization that Core 16 has been involved in every major achievement in the history of aerospace. And that is truly remarkable. And that reflects the leadership, the vision, and brilliance of the faculty, administrators, and more than 6,000 aeronautical engineers who have earned an MIT degree over the last century. As we have seen over the last few days, the department remains committed to excellence and to pushing the boundaries of what is and what might be. And there is no question in my mind that MIT's Aero Astro Department will continue to be a leading force in aerospace for the next 100 years, at least. I want to take a moment to recognize Professor Jaime Perari. Jaime and his team of faculty, staff, and students have done a truly remarkable job of planning and executing this week's activities. They've created a program for which all of us at MIT are very proud of, and my deepest thanks go to him and to the department and his team. Before we begin the Q&A, I'd like to direct your attention to a short video produced by a tremendously innovative company, SpaceX, it shows some of the company's recent successes in advancing private space exploration. DC confirms my computer's in startup. Second stage pressing. Tanks are at flight pressure. F9 switching to internal power. T minus five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off of the Falcon 9. Dragon capsule making its way towards the International Space Station. The station on two, we see Dragon at 20 meters. And capture is confirmed.
as they say in Venezuela, that's a cool video. It is my pleasure uh, to welcome the stars of today's show. Professor Jaime Perari is the H.N. Slater Professor and the head of the Department of Aero and Astro at MIT and will serve as the interviewer for the afternoon. And he'll be guiding a conversation with someone we are absolutely thrilled to welcome to our campus, one of the most creative minds of his generation, Elon Musk. Elon is an engineer and entrepreneur who builds and operates companies to solve environmental, social, and economic challenges. He co-founded PayPal and currently drives strategy, development, and design at two companies he created, the Space Exploration Technologies of SpaceX and Tesla Motors. He's also chairman of Solar City, America's largest solar power provider, and he led SpaceX efforts to be the first private company to successfully launch and dock a spacecraft with the International Space Station. And for his brilliance as an entrepreneur and his impressive creativity as an engineer, he's a folk hero to all of us here at MIT. Please welcome Professor Jaime Perari and Mr. Elon Musk. Good afternoon. Over the last three days, we have been celebrating a century of MIT Aerospace Innovation. We have looked at the lessons learned from the past, the excitement of the present, and speculated about the future. The common thing underlying this incredible hundred years has been the, the passion of the visionaries. People like Hans Sacker, Doolittle, Garner, Draper, and Siemens. Who better than Elon Musk to add to this roster of visionaries and culminate this symposium and join us as we launch our second century of aerospace at MIT. Elon is an innovator and an inspiration to a new generation of engineers and entrepreneurs. First of all, Elon, thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here and welcome you to MIT. Great, thank, thank you. Thanks for having me. So perhaps I'd like to start and ask you if you could elaborate a little bit on what we've seen on the video. <laughs> okay, that was quite a lot. Um, well, I mean, what we're seeing there uh, is, um, and, and I just like, like our communications team put it together, so I just like saw it for the first time in the back there. <laughs> uh, like, probably a bit too much slow-mo. Um, so the, uh, you know, what we're seeing there is our Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, and our Dragon spacecraft, and then we're seeing some of the uh, initial tests of the re reusable version of Falcon 9 that is capable of taking off and landing, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, reusability is, a, is really, I think, the critical breakthrough needed in rocketry to uh, take things to the next level. When do you think you might be able to fly an operational reusable first stage? Well, uh, we've been able to. Uh, soft land boost, uh, the, the rocket booster in the ocean twice so far. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, sort of sat there for several seconds, then tipped over and exploded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> much, <laughs> yeah, just it's quite difficult to reuse at the point. Um, the, the, um, and unfortunately, you know, it's like, a, it's, a four, it's as tall as a 14-story building, so you know, when a 14-story building falls over, it's quite a, quite a belly flop. Um, and uh, so what we need to do is to be able to uh, either land on a floating platform or uh, ideally boost back to the launch site and land back at the launch site. Um, but before we boost back to the launch site and try to land there, we need to show that we can land with precision uh, over and over again. Just, you know, so otherwise something bad could happen. Um, but if it doesn't boost back to where, it's, where we intended. Um, so we, we, for, the, for the upcoming launch, I think we've got a chance of uh, landing on, on a floating landing platform. We actually have a, a huge uh, uh, platform that's being constructed at a shipyard in Louisiana right now, uh, which is, um, well, it's huge, huge-ish. I mean, it's uh, about 300 feet long by 170 feet wide. 
Um, that looks very tiny from space. Um, and and the, the, the leg span of the rocket is 60 feet. So, you know, you've got, and this is going to be um, positioning itself out in the ocean with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with engines that'll keep it, in it, or try to keep it in a particular position, but it's tricky. You've got these big rollers and, uh, you know, and uh, GPS errors, so, um, but, you know, so it's, con it's, it's, it's not anchored because it's like out in the bloody Atlantic, so. Um, so that, that's, that's we're, we're gonna, but we're gonna try to land on that on the next flight. And if, if we land on that, then I think we'll be able to refly that booster. Uh, but I'd, it's probably l maybe not more than a 50% chance or less of, of landing it on the platform for the first time. But there's a lot of launches that will occur over the next year. So there's at least a dozen launches that will occur over the next 12 months. And I think, uh, I think it's quite likely, probably 80, 90% likely, that one of those flights will be able to land and refly. So I think we're quite close. Uh, I'm curious to, to know why you chose to go with a retro thrust rocket uh, for landing as opposed to just wings and wheels and run on a, or land on a runaway like, like the shuttle, say. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of reasons. Um, the, if you like, like the, the long-term ambition of, of SpaceX is to develop technologies necessary to establish a self-sustaining city on Mars or civilization on Mars. And uh, wings and, and a runway don't really work if you're going somewhere other than Earth. Um, you know, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so wings and, a wheel, w wings and wheels are, you know, there's no, run there's no runways and there's no atmosphere. <laughs> Not a good choice for the moon. Um, and then on Mars, there are also no runways, um, and the atmosphere is very thin. Um, and so unless you, you know, like, you know, try to land something at supersonic velocity, it's unlike, it's just not a good choice for Mars either. Um, so, so you really have to get good at propulsive landing if you want to go someplace other than Earth, um, which, which is why you have rockets, because obviously aircraft work quite well on Earth. Um, so, and then, uh, but, but even for Earth recovery, uh, if, you know, when, when you really look at it, um, uh, even if other planets had atmospheres, the, the, the actually the penalty for propulsive landing is quite low. Like you can just do you, you can just do an easy calculation of what's the terminal velocity, um, and then how long do you have to fire the engine at what g level uh, to get to zero zero velocity, um, and. And then if you do some interesting things, like if you look at our, our landing gear, they're essentially like giant body flaps. Um, so the, the drag, uh, when we deploy the landing gear, the dra drag massively increases. And so we have dual use of the landing gear as giant body flaps and as, land as landing gear. Um, and it actually cuts the terminal velocity in half. Um, and, and therefore, the, you know, the fuel, the, the propellant that we need to stop the vehicle in half. Um, and actually, it's quite an efficient method of of, of landing uh, precisely. You, you can use less mass if you want to do parachutes to a water landing, um, but then reusability is negatively affected. And, okay. Any near-term plans for a reusable second stage rocket? Um, the, the, the next generation vehicles after the, the Falcon architecture will be designed for full reusability. I, I don't expect the, the Falcon line to have a reusable upper stage, uh, just just because the uh, you know, with with a, with a kerosene-based system, the, the specific impulse isn't really high enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the missions we do for commercial satellite deployment are just geostationary missions, so the we're really going very far out. These are high delta velocity missions, so. To try to get something back from that is really difficult. Um, but uh, with the next generation of, of vehicles, uh, which is um, a, 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 a um, sub-cooled methane oxygen system, um, you know, where the propellants are cooled to close to their freezing temperature um, to increase the density, uh, we could definitely do a full reusability. Um, and, and that system is intended to be a fully reusable Mars transportation system. So not merely to low Earth orbit, but all the way to Mars and back. What are we talking about? Full reusability. Three years? <laughs> 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 
I mean, I'm an optimistic person, but... <laughs> Always. I, I, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I think we could start to see some test flights in the five or six year time frame. Mm -hmm. um, but we're talking about a much bigger vehicle. Much bigger vehicle together. Yeah, Maybe. and the, um, we're also going to be upgrading to uh, sort of a, a new generation, a, a, a harder engine cycle, which okay. is a, a, a full flow staged combustion. Mm -hmm. um, so what we have right now is an open cycle uh, engine. So. Um, I mean, I, right now I'd say, like, engines are, are our weakest point at SpaceX. Um, but they will be, become as strong as the, as the structures and avionics in the next generation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so let me change a little bit. SpaceX is only 12 years old, and you have shown that in some aspects you can compete head-to-head -head with much more established launch service providers like Lockheed and Boeing and the Europeans. To what do you ascribe this ability of a young and conventional company to take on the establishment? Sure, and actually, just to clarify another point. Like, like right now, our weakest point is engines with respect to specific impulse, but not with respect to thrust to weight. We actually have the highest thrust to weight of any engine, uh, I think maybe ever. But, but our uh, specific, specific impulse, impulse, the efficiency of the engine, is uh, about 10% worse than, uh, the, than a staged combustion engine uh, of the, using the same propellant. Um, the, uh, in terms of our competitiveness, um, I think the, uh, I, I think it, it, it most comes down to our pace of innovation. Um, our pace of innovation is much, much faster than uh, the, the big uh, aerospace companies or the sort of country-driven systems. Um, and this is generally true if you look at innovation from large companies or from smaller companies. Smaller companies are generally better at innovating than, than larger companies. Um, and and it, it has to be that way from a Darwinian standpoint, because uh, sm smaller companies would, would just die if they didn't try innovating. Because um, otherwise people just keep buying the product from the, the big company. Um, so, but, I mean, and, and so then well, why is SpaceX more innovative? Um, I think it's probably because we've, we've got like a, a, a super engineering driven culture. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, we're running kind of the Silicon Valley operating system. Um, it's, just a little, it's kind of hard to describe. Like, it's like, how do you describe Linux? Like, you know, like, uh, you know, like Linux is you know, more efficient than some other operating systems. <laughs> to, to, to remain nameless. <laughs> like, exactly why? It's just like, you really have to get into the weeds. Um, so, and, but, but, you know, it's, you have a, it's a, a fairly flat hierarchy. You, you uh, promote rapid communication, sort of a best ideas when, a best ideas wins culture, um, as opposed to, the, you know, the having the seniority of the person decide the solution, which, I mean, that should never be the case in engineering. It should always be, you know, a rational basis. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I also believe that, um, the, uh, in terms of, of at the leadership level, I'd much rather promote someone who has strong engineering ability than so-called management ability. Um, mm. And um, you know, like we, we we do hire some MBAs, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> but, we uh, but <laughs> we, <laughs> it's usually in spite of the MBA, not because of it. <laughs> I think that deserves an applause. <laughs> You're really pushing the concept of reusability as, as a way to affordability, but um, would you agree that the only way you justify making a more expensive reusable vehicle is if you can guarantee a minimum frequency of flights? And is the market there? What, how are, in the, in the, say, five years, ten year period, yeah. who is going to provide that demand? Where is it going to come from? Well, I mean, it is a chicken and egg sort of situation. I mean, the, the reason that there's low demand for space flight is because it's ridiculously expensive. Um, and, and, you know, so, so somebody, at some point somebody has to say, okay, we're going to make something that's much more affordable and, and then see what the applications sure. develop. The, the, you know, that's, that's what has to happen. I mean, the situation in rocketry is, it's like if an aircraft, the, uh, imagine if aircraft were single use, um, then how many people would fly? I mean, like the flight rate would be really low. Um, 
buy a 747, it's like $250 million, so maybe $300 million, and you need two of them for a round trip. Um, <laughs> so no, nobody's paying like half a billion dollars to fly it from Boston to London. Um, and, and if that were the case, there'd be like a very small number of flights for like scientific and military purposes. And people like who would say, wow, the, the market for aircraft is so tiny. Um, people really love going by boat. Uh, you know, <laughs> It's nonsense. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, we have, if we have rockets that are reusable, we could um, reduce the, you know, fully reusable and can get to a decent flight rate. The potential is there to get a two order of magnitude reduction in the cost of space transport, which is um, vital for establishing, establishing a self sustaining civilization on another planet, uh, or even on, you know, on the moon or some sort of L5 colony or whatever. But, you really need to get the cost, we need a two order of magnitude improvement at least in the cost of transport. In fact, I mean, relative to the estimates of what it costs to do a Mars mission, a manned Mars mission, where you know, I think like the, some of the lower estimates are at the 100 to 200 billion dollar level, you know, for a four person mission, uh, we, need, we need more like a 10,000 fold reduction. How to make it viable. Yeah, well, well, I mean, so people can afford to go. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see space tourism as a, as a customer? As a, people wanting to just pay to be in orbit? In yeah, a, I mean, I think there's some sort of a, a private, space, private space flight is going to be some, some amount of market. Um, yeah, I, okay. I, I don't really know. I mean, really, we're, just, we're trying to advance uh, rocket technology. Um, and, I mean, on, on the one hand, if, if we are even... Uh, if we get even slightly towards the overarching goal of uh, Mars colonization level technology, like if we just get slightly there, we, we certainly have a viable business uh, in launching satellites and servicing mm -hmm. the space station, that kind of thing. Because, like, yeah, I mean, uh, we're, you know, for like 5%, <laughs> you know, so, so it's not like there's... There's still a very viable business doing Earth orbit. Oh, so and, 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 there there. and even if, like, for five percent towards okay. that goal, we're like vastly more competitive than the other uh, rocket companies. Um, okay. so we, do, we do have a lot of people gang up against us these days. Um, okay. I understand. Like, I understand. <laughs> Let's talk about Mars. Uh, that's what really excites a lot of the people in the audience. Uh, a lot excites many of us. Uh, how are we going to get there? First of all. What are in your mind, say, two, three top technologies that we need to develop, that we need to improve to, to get us closer to where we want to be? Sure. And second, I also like some comments as to what would be useful intermediate missions. Are we going to use the moon? Is the moon a, yeah, I think a necessary I, step on our way to Mars? I don't think the moon is a necessary step, but it, I think if you've got a uh, rocket and spacecraft capable of going to Mars, you might as well go to the moon along, along the way. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's like I mean, it's like crossing the English Channel relative to going to Mars. You know? So it's like, you know, if you have these ships that can cross the Atlantic, would you cross the English but, Channel? Probably. Um, but you don't you see know. necessary from a logistics perspective. No, definitely not. Um, it's it's definitely not necessary. But you probably end up having a moon base, um, just because like, why not? You know. Um, uh, so, um, but in terms of the key technology, yeah, key key technologies. Um, I mean, obviously, it'd be great to have some sort of fundamental new thing that has never existed before and uh, like pushes the boundaries of physics. That would be great. Uh, but as far as you know, the physics that we know today, I think uh, I actually think we've got the the, the basic ingredients are are there. Um, like if, um, I mean, if, if, if we, if you do uh, densified, a densified Methalox rocket uh, with uh, on-orbit refueling, Earth-orbit refueling, so you like load the spacecraft, spacecraft into orbit, and you send a bunch of refueling missions to fill up the tanks, um, and you have the uh, Mars colonial fleet, essentially, that gets built up during the... Um, time between the Earth-Mars uh, synchronizations, which occur every 26 months, and then the, and the fleet sort of all departs uh, at, at the optimal uh, transfer point. I think, um, I think we have, we don't need anything 
like so we don't need any any sort of thing that people don't already know about. I, I believe I believe we've got the building blocks, but but the mass efficiency is extremely important. So uh, having better heat shields mm -hmm. um, uh, that that are, you know obviously they're are, are reusable. Um, is radiation on humans? Pardon me? Radiation on humans a concern? Yeah, I mean, things that can mitigate the radiation effects, certainly. I mean, I think the radi radiation effects are generally way overblown. Because um, you know, uh, if you went to the moon, deep, went, went like two weeks in deep space, uh, Buzz Aldrin's still around. Um, <laughs> yeah. Many other folks that went are also in the audience. <laughs> yeah, great. I mean, so, like, obviously, it didn't cause, like, they're still alive and they, you know, they're, yeah, so they seem okay. <laughs> so, so um, you know, people have been up in the space station for like a year or more. Um, they're, they're okay. okay. Um, so it's, it's, I don't, I don't, I mean, th th if there are things we can do to mitigate the, 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 the radiation en route, um, mm -hmm. you know, by effective placement of the water, so let's say the, if, you know, mm -hmm. the water you're bringing there, like, put, mm -hmm. yeah, put that in the direction of the sun. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, I really think we've got the, the sort of essential agreements. That, I mean, we do need uh, an efficient uh, propellant depot on Mars. Uh, so that's, but, but I mean, I really, I think this is like, there's a lot of, I mean, obviously a lot of hard work in engineering that needs to be done, but, but it's there, like the pieces are there. Do you foresee um, robotic missions ahead of human missions going to Mars and uh, to, to prepare the ground? For, for people. Yeah, yeah, so I think that'd be, yeah. I mean, we have like, you know, the, uh, we have rovers on, the, on Mars. Already. And mm -hmm. We're not already. So I think we'll see more robots on Mars. And we probably want to make sure that the propellant depot works. there be an automated propellant depot. Um, and there's some questions as to you know, how do, what, what do you do for power generation on Mars? Do you uh, have a nuclear reactor? You know, then you've got to carry the nuclear fuel there. Um, and reactors are, you know, fairly heavy. Um, do you do uh, some lightweight solar mm -hmm. power system? You know, it's a, sort of maybe a big inflatable solar arrays or something like that. Um, so just power generation on Mars, I think, is an interesting problem. Um, and then just figuring out, like, how to get all of the bits of efficiency right for creating, mm -hmm. say, methane and oxygen on Mars. Um, you know, Mars has got a CO2 atmosphere, and there's there's a lot of water sort of buried in the soil uh, mm -hmm. that you can get rid of. You can get, so. uh, question that has been discussed over the past couple of days: Should we be considering one trips, one way only trips to Mars? Uh, what's the best uh, approach to to colonize uh, the planet? Is it? Uh, well, what's your view? Is that socially acceptable? Do you think people will sign up to do it? I think there's plenty of people that have signed up for a one-way trip to Mars. Um, <laughs> but, but, Maybe but, if I could, we could have a show of hands, <laughs> who would consider such an option? Right? I see some, not many, but perhaps enough for a couple of missions. So it's certainly, <laughs> certainly be enough. I, mean, I think it's sort of like, is, is it a one-way mission and then you die? Or is it a one-way mission and you get resupplied? That's a big difference. Let me do it. <laughs> Wait for the second option. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's, it ends up being a moot point because y you want to bring the spaceship back. Like, these spaceships are expensive, okay? They're hard to build. <laughs> you can't just leave them there. <laughs> so, whether or not people want to come back or not is kind of like they can jump on it if they want, but they need the spaceship back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, it's kind of weird. Like, there's like a huge collection of spaceships on Mars over time. And we're like, <laughs> it's like, maybe we should send them back. I mean, of course we should send them back. Uh, so that, I think that's, that's for sure like, necessary, it, particularly if you say we, we want to have a colony of some kind that's of significant size. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, just one question. Uh, looking at the, at the Apollo experience, are you concerned that, say we land humans in Mars in, day, in say, 10, 15 years, and then all of a sudden, the excitement is done, we've done it, and just go and rest for the next 50 years like we did with Apollo. Is that something that concerns you? Yeah, well, that's why I think we should really be setting the goal as the creation of a self-sustaining civilization on Mars, not simply a mission to Mars, because uh, then we, we risk um, 
you know, it would be awesome and cool and it would be a new high altitude record and, you know, great pictures and stuff. But, I mean, it would be, it's, it's, just, it's just not the thing that fundamentally changes the future of humanity. Um, and, and this, I mean, I should sort of explain perhaps the rationale for, uh, you know, why I think it's important to establish a um, self-sustaining uh, colony on Mars. Because uh, uh, I think you know, some people are aware of that, but probably most people uh, aren't. Um, and you, know, you hear all these rebuttals, like, aren't there all these problems on Earth that we need to deal with, and shouldn't we focus on that? Um, and, and the answer is yes. I mean, our primary focus should be problems on Earth, uh, but I think that there should be some small amount that's given over to the establishment of, uh, of, of a colony on Mars and making life multiplanetary. Uh, by small amount, I mean some number less than 1% of our resources. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not as important as, as, say, healthcare, but it's more important than like, say, cosmetics. I mean, I'm, like, I'm pro, I mean, I'm, I'm in favor of cosmetics. I like them, they're great. Um, but, you know, lipstick or colony on Mars. I don't know. People may have different opinions, but, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I, think, I think we should, we should have that. And, um, because the, the, the future of humanity will fundamentally bifurcate um, along the lines of either single-planet species or multi-planet species. Um, and uh, a multi-planet uh, version of humanity or of, of humanity's future is going to last a lot longer. Uh, we will propagate civilizations in the future far longer if we are multi-planet species than if we are a single-planet species. Um, and, uh, and so it's like planetary redundancy backing up the biosphere. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, we, we've got all of our eggs in one basket here. Um, we should try to protect that basket and do everything we can, but, but there are so, some risks that are just extremely difficult uh, to mitigate, um, and some which we, we will ultimately not be able to mitigate. Um, so it just seems like the right thing to do. And then the question is, the next question is, well, should we do it now, or should we just, should we wait for some point in the future? And I think, I think it's, the wise move is to do it uh, now, because the window of technology for this is open, and it's the first time that window has been open in the four and a half billion year history of Earth. Okay, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, I, hope, I certainly hope that the window will be open um, you know, for you know, forever, um, but it, it may also close. Um, and if you look at the history of technology in various civilizations, you look at, say, ancient Egypt, where they were able to build these incredible giant pyramids, um, and then they forgot how to build pyramids, um, and then they couldn't read hieroglyphics. Um, or you look at, say, Roman civilization, and they were able to build these incredible aqueducts and roads, and then they forgot how to do that. Um, and they, had in, they had indoor plumbing, they forgot how to do indoor plumbing. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's just, there's, there's clearly been a cycle with, with technology. Um, and, you know, hopefully, that, that's an upward sloping sine wave that you know, continues on to, to be really great in the future, but maybe it doesn't. You know, maybe there's some bad thing that happens. Um, and, and so for 1% of our resources, we could buy life insurance for life collectively, and I think okay. that would be a good thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in a, I'm sure the topic of, of Mars is going to come again because in a few minutes I'd like to open the floor uh, for questions. But uh, I have a couple more questions I, I'd really like to, to get your, your opinion on. Uh, it's related to your association, well, your, your involvement with uh, Tesla and, and Solar City. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your announced plans to construct a battery gigafactory? And, um, can you elaborate on this? What's the driver? Is it satisfy demands, reduce costs, improve efficiencies, or all of the above? For the, for the gigafactory? Yes. Uh -huh. um, so the, the you know the, the gigafactory is like the least bad solution we could come up with, honestly. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's actually pretty cool the way it's worked out, uh, but we're just faced with a simple problem of if we want to make electric cars, we need enough batteries for the electric cars. Um, and, and so, well, last year, all lithium ion production combined was 30 gigawatt hours, approximately. Um, that's nothing, okay? Uh, or at least, it's nothing when you consider, like, if you want to make half a million electric cars a year, that's how much you need. Um, 
And there are 100 million new cars made every year. There are 2 billion uh, gasoline or diesel cars on the road worldwide. Um, so just do the basic math. You don't just need one gigafactory. You need like 200 gigafactories just for new car production. And that assumes you're only going to replace the fleet at the existing rate, uh, which has it um, refreshed every 20 years. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so the, given that we want to try to get to full capacity at our Fremont plant in California of half a million vehicles a year, uh, we need half a million vehicles a year of batteries. Um, and obviously we can't use all of the other factories in the world combined because people want cell phones and laptops and other things. <laughs> so, <laughs> therefore, we have to build this factory. And then we found we have a great partner in Panasonic. Um, you know, Panasonic's taking care of the kind of the cell formation right. part of it. Th there are actually many aspects to this because you've got sort of anode, cathode, separator, electrolyte can um, at the precursor level. Um, you've got sort of raw materials coming in from the mines uh, that, that sort of feed into uh, a variety of other companies um, uh, like you know, Sumitomo, Sumitomo Metals and Mining and Itachi and, and others. And, that they do the precursor processing and then uh, Panasonic takes the anode and cathode materials separate and whatnot, does create, puts that into a cell. Then it goes into a Tesla section, which uh, creates the module, which is all the electronics and the uh, packaging and the conductors, uh, the safety mechanisms and the cooling loops. Then the modules go into the pack, which then uh, you know, create, has a lot of crash structure associated with it, and the pack goes in the car. And then, and then uh, obviously, Tesla is kind of the, um, uh, the landlord of the whole thing as well. Um, anyway, that's like yeah. short of doing that. There was no no way to scale, so that's why we did it. The reason why I brought that up is because as much as we love Teslas, we are in an aerospace department where we are really interested in the potential for electric aircraft. Sure, and I love I love the idea of electric <laughs> aircraft. It's, everything we, will go electric. Full, everything will go we, fully electric except for rockets. We, <laughs> it's, we it's think, ironic. We think that. In terms of energy density, to make uh, transport aircraft feasible, you would need improvements in, in of the order of 10 to 100. What? No, that's not okay. Wait, when you say 10 to 100, of what baseline? What, what do you mean? A current ion lithium. Oh, okay. no, no, definitely not. Uh, uh, I, so, so I, in my opinion, at least, the, you know, where we are right now is at roughly, for, you know, for a, a cell that doesn't have like lots of other drawbacks, uh, which people always forget to mention when they talk about uh, battery breakthroughs, um, you know, there's many parameters that are important for a battery, um, and they'll, you know, hardly a week goes by where there's not some huge breakthrough allegedly in batteries. But like the, the bullshit factor is outrageous. Um, so, but for for real cells that actually work and don't have like some huge drawback. Um, they're currently at about 300 watt hours per kilogram, um, and if you you you're, to, to have a compelling aircraft, you only really need about 400 watt hours per kilogram, provided your the your, the percentage of cell on the craft on the on the aircraft is high. It doesn't need to be anywhere near as high as the, it is on a rocket, um, but if it's sort of at the 70 percent level um, at 400 watt hours per kilogram, um, you can do very decent range. Um, and if you sort of move it up to the sort of mid, mid to high 70s, you can go transcontinental. But with, you know, not, not intercontinental, but sort of, sort of west coast to east coast. Um, so you need, need an efficient aircraft, uh, but, but that's, that's approximately, by my calculations, the, the numbers you need 400 watt hours per kilogram, mid to high 70s cell mass fraction, um, which I think is an achievable number. Um, because like aircraft have all these like unnecessary things like tails and like rudders and elevators <laughs> it's like not needed. <laughs> that, <laughs> just just that, just gimbal, you know. It, it, anyway, you gimbal gimbal the electric fan. Like, like for some weird reason, like gimbling motors is normal in rockets and not in aircraft. Like, well, why not? <laughs> Okay, well, it definitely plans to get into this business because we love to, to see the, how, how things develop in that particular area. Certainly very interesting. I mean, do you have a specific plans? Um, I mean, I've been sort of toying with the design for 
an electric supersonic vertical takeoff and landing electric aircraft for a while. Um, I'd, I'd love to do it, um, but I think my mind would explode. <laughs> it's like brains worn out, you know. It's like pretty saturated working on electric cars and, and rockets. Um, so. Okay, okay, good topic. <laughs> so let me, the last question I will ask is uh, about our students. Uh, you've hired dozens of MIT graduates for your companies. The first question is, how are they doing? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> they're, no, they're, doing, they're doing great. Um, so uh, yeah, in fact, we, we, we want to hire a lot more people from MIT. That's yeah. good news, and I'm sure it's, a lot uh, of people in the audience Yeah, just d definitely you know apply to SpaceX, apply to, to Tesla, um, and like yell at me on Twitter if, if there's something wrong with our, our, our admissions process or something. <laughs> that seems to be like I mean it's not the most efficient way to get get to people, but um, that that is one way. Because um, I, I don't I don't know if, if like our you know recruiting and and sort of pro and, our, and our process for hiring people is is good or I think it's good, but I'm not sure. So. Uh, but we want to hire lots of really smart engineers because that's, that's how these problems get solved. Uh, I read a quote, which I hope it's true, from you. Tell me if that's not the case, that you said that uh, the most common mistake, hiring mistake was weighing too much on someone's talent and not on someone's personality. And then it, I think it matters whether someone has a good heart. It does, yes, absolutely. Um, so it, 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 that's, that's generally where, if I say where it's sort of the the hiring mistakes that I've made in the past, it's, it's, been, um, it's, it's been just as I said, it's, it's looking too much at their intellectual in capability alone um, and not on how they affect those around them. Um, and uh, it, it, what really matters is for, for, for someone's contribution to a company is how they are as an individual and how they affect others around them. I mean, you could say it's also analogous to a sports team you know, if, if someone, um, the, the best person on the team is not necessarily the one who scores the most goals. It, it could be the person who assists in the most goals. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if somebody is, if, if there's one person on the team who's just, just wants the ball all the time and just wants to kick it at the goal, um, that can actually be detrimental. Um, and um, so it, it's, it is important uh, to, to, to weigh uh, personality and just, uh, you know, are, are they going to be a good person and what people like working with them and that kind of thing. It's, it does make a difference. Thank you. I'd like to uh, invite the audience to ask some questions. I particularly like students to ask questions, but others are also invited. And one thing I will ask is that we keep the questions short so that we can have a few of those. Okay. So. Cut off. Uh, this is, I'm Phil Chapman. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, Elon, is uh, it looks as if the next decade or two human spaceflight will be dominated by you and Bob Bigelow and other <laughs> exopreneurs. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, what do you think the proper role of NASA human spaceflight should be in that context, other than just giving you contracts? <laughs> um, well, well, NASA's been really helpful to SpaceX. Um, you know, not, not just in terms of giving us contracts, but also um, technically in a number of areas. And, and a lot of the things that we've done at SpaceX have been uh, dependent on things that NASA's done in the past. So um, you know, I think we're certainly incredibly grateful for everything that NASA's done in the past and, and, and for the ongoing support that we receive from NASA. Um, so I'm a huge fan of NASA. Um, and, but, and, I, and I, I think NASA is actually doing the right thing given all of the constraints that they have. Like if, if, if you know, within the context of being this large government entity that's getting pushed in all sorts of different directions and, and has a lot of limitations on the, what it can do, um, I've been pretty impressed with what NASA has done given all of those constraints. Um, and. Um, yeah, so I think it's, you know, if, if NASA continues, it continues to sort of expand upon uh, the, the support of competitive commercial space, that's, that's probably what will have the most positive effect on, on the future of space development. 
Thank you. So um, I'm Jordan, and I had a quick question about manufacturing. So Obama has had a large push to really get high technology manufacturers in the United States, and I think above everything, SpaceX and Tesla are excellent examples of that. And I was wondering, one, do you have a commitment going forward to have um, all your manufacturing or majority of it done in the U.S.? And then, how can other companies really learn from? this experience that SpaceX has had and Tesla has to really do your own manufacturing in-house as much as possible? Sure. Uh, well, I should say that for, for, for SpaceX and, and Tesla, our goal was not initially to do you know, huge amounts of internal manufacturing. So we, we actually tried to, to do as little manufacturing as possible at first, uh, but we found that it, it, we, we had to insource more and more over time. Um, and uh, so I, th I think, um, it, it, but it's not really not from the standpoint of like we really believe in insourcing or outsourcing. It's just given, you know, if, if, the, if there's a great supplier, that then we, we would love to use a great supplier. And if there's not, then we need to, you know, do it ourselves. Um, like we need, either need to find a way or make a way to a good solution. Um, and it's just over time we'd have to, we'd have, we've had to make a way more, more often uh, than not. Um, and, and now for, for rocketry, there's also, there are also ITAR limitations, you know, which is that rockets are considered an advanced weapons technology, so we can't just you know, outsource it to some other country. Um, and um, yeah, so, and, and, but, but then I think for, for manufacturing, I, that very often people think of manufacturing as kind of just some rote process of making copies. Uh, which it is, which actually it, it isn't. Manufacturing is building the machine that makes the machine. Um, and if you think the machine is important, well, building the machine that makes the machine is also extremely important. And more often than not, what what I found is um, the, is the manufacturing is harder than the original product. Like for example, at Tesla, you know, we we can make. Uh, like one of, of, a, of a car very easily, but to make thousands of a car um, with high reliability and quality and where the cost is affordable is extremely hard. I'd say maybe 10 times harder than designing, than just making one prototype, but maybe more. Um, uh, and then at, at SpaceX also, it may be approaching an order of magnitude harder to manufacture rockets and launch, launch a lot of them than to design one in the first place. Um, so I really think a lot more smart people should be getting into manufacturing. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun. So it's like, I don't know, how, it's sort of got a bad name for a while, but I, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I've got a question about the uh, Tesla automobile. I understand uh, the drive motors on the order of 250 horsepower and only weighs 70 pounds, which is multiple horsepower per pound. I've never seen, I've worked in the transit industry, never seen and looked in other sources, never seen a um, motor other than uh, one that weighs multiple pounds per horsepower, the opposite way. Uh, so you have an advantage of like an order of magnitude. Um, some of it can be explained by high speed. Can you explain uh, uh, how you achieve that? Actually, if, if, if power to weight ratio is of interest to you, rocket turbo pumps really take the cake. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the turbo pump on the Merlin engine uh, generates 10,000 horsepower and weighs 150 pounds. Uh, now, you know, fuel efficiency is a sort of separate question. But, uh, <laughs> um, but power to weight is, I mean, it's at the ragged edge of, like, pulling those molecules apart. Um, you know, it's just kind of amazing that any, like you can get 10,000 horsepower in this thing you can basically pick up. Uh, uh, but for, for electric motors, uh, you know, if, if you have a properly designed, you know, electric motor, AC induction motor, um, getting a high power to weight ratio and like a, a, a huge, you know, a really great res um, uh, response rate, like low latency and all that, um, extremely low ripple current and whatnot. In, it's just, it just kind of comes naturally to an AC induction motor. The, the, the bigger challenge is actually um, 
cooling it effectively, and then particularly cooling the, the rotor, because uh, you've got a, this rotor going at like 18,000 RPM. So in the Model S, we, we coaxially cool the rotor um, in order to have high steady state. So also for an electric motor, you can have, uh, it's, it's easy to get uh, peak power for a short period of time. Um, it's hard to have sustained peak power and because you overheat and then uh, it's hard to get high efficiency over uh, a complicated drive cycle. Um, but those tend to be the, the problems we wrestle with more than say the, the peak power. Like we can get peak power pretty easily but sustained power and efficiency over the drive cycle are hard. Thank you. Hi, uh, name's Sherry. I'm a PhD student in Core 16. And when you hear about the founding of SpaceX, a popular story is that you started it partly because you yourself want to go to space. Uh, is this true, and what sort of time frame with the current program do you see for you yourself being able to have that opportunity? Actually, that, that, that's, not, that's not why I started SpaceX, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I mean, the easiest thing for me to do would have been to buy a ride on the Soyuz. Um, and you know, that I would have been able to go to the space station as a number of other people have done. Um, but the, the thing that I was trying to figure out was how to get us back on, on the track of extending life beyond Earth. Uh, that, that's, what the, that's the reason for, for starting SpaceX. And, uh, and I, I expected it to fail. Um, and people sometimes think like, well, why would you even start that in the first place? But the, the reason, if you go back, before I started SpaceX, I expected I, to, I wanted to do this philanthropic mission to uh, send a small greenhouse to the surface of Mars um, and try to get the public excited about sending life to Mars uh, because people respond to precedents and superlatives and this will be the first life on another planet, the furthest the life's ever traveled. And I thought, well, that would get people excited and that would result in NASA's budget getting increased and then we could resume uh, the dream of Apollo. Um, so, you know, that was, my initial goal was just to figure out how to get NASA's budget higher. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but then I came to the conclusion that if we don't make, uh, if we don't make rockets way better, then it, it won't matter. Like, we can get a budget increase, but then we'd, we'd just send one mission to Mars and, and then maybe never go there again. So, so that, the, the, the goal of SpaceX really was to make as much progress as possible to advance rocket technology to the point where hopefully we can establish a colony on Mars. Um, or, and get us, or at least get as far along that way as, as we can. We'll just try to go as far as we can. Hi, I'm Justin. I'm a freshman. Um, now that SpaceX has uh, unveiled the Dragon V2, which is a man-rated capsule, I was wondering if you were planning on uh, forming an, your own astronaut corps or you you're, um, relying on NASA astronauts from here out? Well, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, we're probably, I mean, it's, we're, we're building uh, a ship that, that NASA's going to use and that other people will use. In terms of an astronaut core, I mean, I kind of think, like, like this, really, the, like, what we should be transporting uh, are scientists and engineers. You know, not, it's not, not pilots, really. You know, it's like, Dragon doesn't need pilots. Like, it you know, obviously goes there with just cargo. Um, you know, we just sent up um, 40 mice. Um, they were not piloting the, the craft. <laughs> um, so it's, so, so it's, it's, it's really, it's a means of transporting people to, like, the, the sort of Earth-Moon orbit region uh, in order to you know, do science, basically, um, you know, potentially to the moon to do some exploration there. Uh, but um, but, but it, I, I kind of think it should be easy to go on a spacecraft. <laughs> you know, like, like you, just, you should just be able to get on with no training and go. So, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be hard. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Scarlett. I'm a junior in aerospace at MIT, as you can tell. And uh, I was uh, just wondering, now SpaceX and Boeing have both been awarded contracts uh, to build a space taxi. And how do you think SpaceX's approach will differ from Boeing's? And which one do you think is likely to be most successful? <laughs> well, Boeing's a fine company, of course. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I, I mean, I, what we're trying to do with Dragon, Dragon 2 is, or the, the new crew, crew Dragon design, is be able to land propulsively uh, with precision, um, which I think is kind of the, the next generation. Like, if you consider the first generation was parachutes to a water landing, then, um, you know, arguably sort of wings and gear, land, landing legs, uh, landing gear. Uh, then, like the, the sort of third generation uh, is propulsive landing uh, with precision. I mean, if if you saw a movie about the future with aliens landing, how do they land like that? <laughs> okay, obviously, they don't, they don't like. I mean, it'd be kind of weird if the aliens landed in the ocean with parachutes. I'm mean, like, okay, <laughs> nothing to fear. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, like Boeing's like trying to take it like slightly improved because like it's got airbags, uh, but it's still an imprecise landing. You know, it's somewhere in a huge expanse of desert, and it's basically landing on airbags and kind of crashing in the desert. You know, I'm like okay, that's it's okay. That's one way to land. <laughs> um, but um, I, but I think the, the future has to be a precise propul propulsive landing because that's what you need to go to the moon or to Mars or anywhere else in the solar system, and that's the thing we should be focusing on. And yeah, so, so <laughs> we're already going to the space station back, by the way. Like so Boeing isn't doing that. <laughs> Sorry. So comic books are the future. Well, I think it's a, it's a lot of the things that are envisioned in sci-fi books. I mean, it turns out it's a wide range, of course. Um, yeah, but. Uh, the, um, a lot of things that are envisioned do, do, do make sense. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I mean, I, and like I said, it's like a, there isn't some other way to land on the moon. You know, you can't like land on the moon with parachutes and airbags. Um, let's do the lack of atmosphere over there. You know, so. Thank you. Thank you. Hello there, uh, my name is Johannes, I'm a junior in Core 16, and I'm also international. And I was wondering, uh, from an international perspective, how's this trip to Mars going to look like? Is it going to be an American colony on Mars and that's it? Or is it, because of course SpaceX is ma mainly based here in the US, uh, or is it just like, everybody join in please? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I, mean, I think it's... Uh, um, I mean, I, I'm hopeful there will be multiple colonies on Mars. It's, it's there's certainly, from a SpaceX standpoint, there's nothing, you know, we, we don't aim to do anything sort of on an exclusionary basis. We're just trying to get there. Um, and, and then I think, then, you know, we'd love to have that debate. It'd be like, oh, is it too American? You know, like, okay. <laughs> Maybe, okay, but we've got this awesome base on Mars. Who cares? <laughs> uh, and, and I, but I think if there, if there was, you know, an American base on Mars, it would certainly prompt other countries to want to establish their, you know, base on Mars too. I, I, but I do think it would be better to have competition than, than, than cooperation. It's, it's not... So like, you encourage companies each in other countries to start their own endeavor to go to Mars as well? And, and yes, I, th I think it would, be, it would be better off with competition ra rather than insisting... Like, like, in the, like the space station, you've got the International Space Station, but... We're, like when, when when governments are all sort of forced to go in lockstep, it tends to not make things go faster. Um, and um, yeah, we, we want some sort of positive, com competitive element. I think uh, so. We don't like people going to war or anything, but just like some positive competitive element, like the Olympics. You know, something if people compete hard and it's sort of good sportsmanship and everything, and the net result is better than if like there was no competition. Like Olympics with no competition would make any sense, um, and uh, yeah. So I think some positive competitive thing would be 
would be better. And we should definitely not insist that everyone, all countries go at the same pace or, or some collection of countries go at the same pace. That would slow things down dramatically and maybe not even happen. So just encourage ESA to invest in Mars. Yeah, absolutely. ESA, yeah. Chinese Space Agency, everyone, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Vicent. And my question is, are there any natural resources on Mars right now that a colony would be able to use? And if so, how would SpaceX go about extracting those natural resources when the time comes? Well, I think any, any natural resource extraction on Mars would be, the, the output would be for Mars. Like it definitely wouldn't make sense to transport Mars, stuff 200 million miles back to Earth. Um, you know, honestly, like if you had like crack cocaine on Mars, like in prepackaged, you know, pallets, <laughs> it still wouldn't make sense to transport it back here. <laughs> Maybe good times for the Martians, but <laughs> not back here. Um, These would be for the colony to use, obviously. Yeah, for the colony to use, exactly. <laughs> Hello, my name is Alexander Brucolari. I'm a recent PhD in Course 16, and I recently started up an aerospace research and development company. And one thing that I'm working on is something called beamed energy propulsion, where we use external energy to power rockets, yeah. um, microwaves or lasers, the idea being that you can get very high specific impulses with very high power. And I'm curious where SpaceX stands on this kind of technology, what your thoughts were, if you could comment a little bit. Yeah. Um, the, the, the beamed energy thing is interesting. Um, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it is a worthy area of research. So I, I think it's worth, it's worth trying, to make, trying to make something work. Try, try to get something to, to orbit or a really high uh, delta velocity with, with beamed energy um, and see how, it, how well does it work in practice. Um, but, I mean, I do think there's, you know, I, I mean, I'll state some concerns, but, but these concerns are not meant to say that we shouldn't work on them. I could preface it by saying we should work on it. Um, the, I, I think that there's a, there are some scaling challenges with beamed energy. Um, you have to say, what's the actual power output you need to, to send, say, a Falcon 9 class vehicle to orbit? Uh, and it's, it's a very, very big number. You, know, you start needing, like, whoa, we need, like, the power of, like, the eastern seaboard, um, you know, to, to sort of send something Falcon, the call it Falcon Heavy class, you know, what do you need to send something like that to orbit? It's really a huge amount of energy, uh, or, or a huge amount of power, to be precise. Like, it's actually, the, the power level you need is, is you, know, you don't need, like, arguably not that much on an energy basis, but you can't, like, tell everyone to turn their lights off um, in Florida. Uh, for, for, so, so then you need, like, a huge power plant or a huge capacitor bank or, or a huge high power density battery array. Um, so I'd like to see how this, you know, how well does it scale um, and then, and then you say, what, what have, what's the cost of that? The, the huge power power plant and the huge um, laser array and that kind of thing. And how does that compare to the cost per unit mass if you just carry your own oxygen with you and have a lower ISP um, and don't do any of those things? Hello, uh, my name is Elliot Owen. I'm a freshman here. I'm very interested in the Hyperloop. I made a small working model for my senior project. Oh, that's cool. And one of the major problems I ran into was uh, tube tolerances. So I'm wondering if you can comment on, you know, problems with tube tolerances and thermal expansion if you're building a 350 mile long steel tube. Uh, well, what was the ratio of the of the pod to tube so diameter? Yeah. About two and a half inch internal diameter and about 20 feet long. Right, but how, the pod pod diameter to tube diameter? The pod was only a few hundredths of an inch smaller than the inside uh, diameter. That, that's the problem. Okay. <laughs> um, so you actually want the, the pod to, you, you want a sort of a, uh, a ratio of the called uh, pod area to, uh, you know, uh, uh, tube, into, tube, tube uh, cross section to pod cross section um, of, of about uh, two. You know, so, so the, 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 the pod only is like half the cross-sectional area of the, the tube. Um, and this, because you're still going to want to have some, some flow of air over the, the pod. To deal with the Cantor's limit? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, you, you partly deal with the Cantor's limit by having uh, a compressor on the nose. Um, but it only partly addresses it. Um, and then the rest is uh, airflow around the, the pod. Um, but you definitely, you, you definitely don't want to have something that's, that's really a tight fit. Um, 
and and because they also get start hitting tolerance limitations like that. The um, yeah, you, you, and just you just need you need some some play in that in that system. Um, I, I mean, like a, a tricky thing also for if you're going really fast is just even small imperfections in the surface of the tube, uh, which I think. I think can be dealt with by essentially having, it, it, once the tube's done, you, you'd actually need to, to run something that's going to smooth it out. Like you basically need to run a grinder through the, through the tube that's going to polish the surface um, and make sure that there aren't undulations. Um, but in the proposal in the high I think you know, we had uh, the air skis were sprung. So the, yeah, but that's also important. Okay. And thermal expansion, if you heat it up 20 degrees, this 350 mile long pipe will get 450 feet longer. How do you maintain a vacuum seal with expansion joints? Um, so you, you actually have, you, you, um, uh, you have to allow expansion at the terminals. Um, so at, uh, where, wherever the, the terminals are, you've got to have that, that length of expansion. Um, and then in the, on, in the pylons that are supporting it, you actually need to allow the, each pylon to, to, to stretch um, in, in, in X. So it's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't hard constrain it at the pylons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We've gone past the hour now. Would you be able to take a couple more questions? Yeah, we could probably extend like 10 or 15 more minutes. Perfect. All right. Uh, my name is John, and I was wondering, since there's a, always a growing need for more resources here on Earth, if, like, say, sometime in the future, SpaceX would look more towards obtaining resources from the Moon or Mars or even out farther on asteroids, is that, like, in a plan for SpaceX? Well, we, we're not really going to try to get resources on the Moon, uh, because uh, that's, uh, you know, th that would be useful if you're on the Moon, but not for bringing it back to Earth. Uh, so if there's a moon base, I suspect that they would extract resources, yeah. but, but for themselves. So. I'll try to get through a bunch of questions. So I'm going to answer, make, make my, my answer short. Okay. Hi, my name is Bob. Um, in view of its potential to, to be possibly the biggest game changer ever, do you have any plans to enter the field of artificial intelligence? And in general, what are your thoughts on it? Do you think it's even close to being ready for prime time? I think we should be very careful about artificial intelligence. Um, if I were to guess at what our biggest existential threat is, it's probably that. Um, so we need to be very careful with artificial intelligence. I'm increasingly inclined to think that there should be some uh, regulatory oversight uh, at the inter at maybe at the national and international level, uh, just to make sure that uh, we don't do something very foolish. Um, I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, yeah, you sure you can control the demon? <laughs> Doesn't work out. I take it there will be no Hell 9000 going up to Mars. <laughs> Hell 9000 would be easy. <laughs> it's way more complex than, I mean, it would put Hell 9000 to shame. Yeah. That's like a puppy dog. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hi, my name is Rachelle Anaceto, and I'm a junior in the Aeroastro Department. Um, my question aligns with how a lot of the work toward the mission to Mars is focused on rockets with SpaceX, obviously, but where do you see the role of telecommunications and communication satellites since there's a lot of traction in this field, and this will be very crucial to, I guess, the overall mission to colonizing Mars? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I was just sort of... Yes. Thinking about the AI thing for a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. So a lot of the focus with the mission to Mars aligns with rocket SpaceX, yeah. but um, a key aspect to eventually colonizing Mars aligns with telecommunications and communication yeah. satellites. So where do you see this as a viable aspect along with your goals? Uh, communications is certainly very important. Um, we're going to need... Um, terabit level communication between Earth and Mars, which uh, necessarily means that you want to have a tight beam, like a laser communication system or something like that, um, and, and relays, you know, sort of um, satellites that relay it, because sometimes Mars is on the other side of the sun, so you've got, you, you've got to bounce the photons around the sun, 
not through them. Um, and you know, so I think communication is definitely going to be important. Um, also, see, th think that on Earth there's a, there's a lot of potential for space-based communications. Um, I think that there's a huge amount of room to grow for having satellite communication systems that provide high bandwidth global coverage. Um, and we'll need the same for Mars. Hi, I'm Eric Ward. I'm a graduate student in the System Design and Management program. And um, I was reading recently a Japanese uh, construction company, I think it's Obayashi, just announced plans to make a space, uh, a space elevator by, I think, 2050. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering if, if SpaceX say, has a response. I say, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you think that technology might affect your vision and goals as well? <laughs> I mean, I think it would be awesome if there was a space elevator. I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, I mean, I don't think it's realistic, um, but, you know, it'd love to be proven wrong. Um, so um, I always think of, like, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory when I hear the space elevator, you know. Um, but because people th sort of manage, like, an elevator, you press up, and <laughs> you're just like, well, now you're in space. Um, <laughs> this is, like, a real, this is extremely complicated. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think it's really realistic to have a space elevator, um, you know, and I mean, let me put it this way, like, at the point at which we have, like, a bridge from L.A. to Tokyo, um, uh, which I think is a much easier problem, <laughs> then, then we, or, you know, how about across the Atlantic, you know, like, some sort of 2,000 mile long bridge, uh, to a 3,000 mile long bridge, you know, something like that um, would be, you know, made of like carbon nanotubes. Like we haven't, I don't think we've got a carbon nanotube footbridge so far, um, let alone some enormous 60,000 mile long space elevator. Um, anyway, so I think, I think we're, it's, it's, it wouldn't be, it's not the thing that I think makes sense right now, but hey, if somebody can prove me wrong and that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Koki Ho. I'm a PhD student here. Uh, I wonder how you think about Mars One project, which tried to send crew to Mars one way um, every two years for a reality TV show. I think they claim they want to use the uh, modified Dragon capsule uh, for landing. And uh, I wonder how you think about their uh, philosophy and uh, their technical feasibility. Thank you. Well, I think they're, they're, I mean, the illustrations that I've seen basically has them using a bunch of SpaceX rockets and Dragon spacecraft. Um, I'm like, okay, if, I mean, if they want to buy a bunch of Dragons and Falcon 9 rockets, that's cool. We'll, sell, we'll, you know, we'll certainly sell them. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't think they've got, you know, anywhere near the funding to buy even one. So I, I think, therefore, it's unrealistic. Uh, and I think trying to go to Mars in Dragon is less than ideal. Um, you know, because it's at least a, well, it's kind of, if you go real fast, it's maybe a three-month journey, and normally it'd be more like a six to eight-month journey. That's a long time to spend in something with the interior volume of an SUV. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend waiting for the next generation technology. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ben Sun. I'm a recent graduate. Um, I had another space elevator question, actually. What do uh -huh. you think would be the difference in public perception if instead of building rockets, you were building space elevators? How would the promo video have changed? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think it would not work. Uh, <laughs> it would just be an illustration on a page that doesn't actually have real hardware. Uh, that would be the difference. Yeah, I mean, I just don't, I, 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 I just don't think space elevator is like a very sensible thing. You know, so. Thank you. Hi, I'm Evan, and I'm a sophomore. I just a question about um, the future of the supercharger network. Um, will renewable energy sources play a big role in the source for that for the network? Yeah, absolutely. What we're planning to do over time is uh, go to 100% renewable power generation for our solar uh, our, our supercharged uh, stations. Um, you know, we've sort of temporarily, you know, not not added solar power because, in the interest of just having. Uh, uh, national and international coverage that you can drive anywhere in the U.S., Europe, or Asia uh, using superchargers. Uh, we haven't we haven't um, constrained that so that every supercharger has to have solar panels. There are a few that have solar panels, most don't. But in the long term, um, all of them will either have solar, so, solar panels or uh, otherwise get their power from renewable sources. 
Um, and uh, in, in long term, I expect it to be solar panels to a stationary battery pack um, so that the solar panels can sort of charge the, the, the stationary battery pack over the course of the week. Um, and then the, the stationary battery pack can then buffer the, buffer the energy um, and release it during peak times. Because what we see with superchargers is um, huge differences in usage. And you can imagine, like, if, when people go away for the weekend, like Friday nights and Saturday nights, uh, Friday and Sunday, Friday nights and Sunday nights, huge peak usage. People are going somewhere, like, on a family trip for the weekend. Um, but say, you know, uh, Wednesday at, uh, you know, 11 a.m., uh, low usage. Um, so you want to have battery, stationary battery pack, solar panels, and, and, and then, then it could work even if the power grid goes down. You know, so that's like, I think like, that would be cool to have something like even post-apocalypse, you know, <laughs> you can still drive around. <laughs> okay, perhaps we can take a couple more if they are quick. Uh, hello, my name is Rita. I'm a sophomore in course two, so mechanical engineering. Um, so I'm more of a car buff myself. So concerning Tesla, um, what is your approach to dealing with new companies trying to make it in the EV world, like Ativa and others? Is it more of a collaborative approach in terms of sharing technology so we can see more electric vehicles on the roads in the near future, or maintaining a competitive edge? Um, well, I, I think, you know, given that we open sourced our patents earlier this year, I think we're, you know... Uh... Yeah, I, I, th I think that suggests that we're trying to be helpful. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's certainly, you know, if, if, if there's anything that Tesla can do that's helpful and doesn't distract us from making cars, then we're happy to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, we've also done um, uh, battery packs and powertrains for Mercedes and for Toyota. Um, I mean, right now, the fundamental constraint is on battery production. So we have to solve that constraint in order for there to be any uh, scaling up of electric cars. And that's why we've got the Gigafactory and, um, you know, and, and, and things have to be affordable. Basically, people need uh, a, a compelling and affordable uh, electric vehicle. That is the holy grail. So that's really what we're, we're, we're trying to get there as fast as we can. Fantastic. Thank right. you. Hi, uh, so um, I'm Daniel and I'm a junior at MIT. And uh, so here's a decidedly non-technical question. Um, so I understand that you um, have consumed lots of science fiction literature, films, etc. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is what you're doing. Yeah. So um, I was just wondering what uh, kind of works of um, art that you've um, that you think have contributed to your zeal for a good future for humanity, whether by um, kind of influencing your fear, like cyberpunk stuff, or um, like making you see um, something that's awesome, like Star Trek. Or yeah, um, sure. Well, I mean, I mean, I love technology, and um, so I, yeah. I mean, particularly when I was a kid, I just consumed like all science fiction and fantasy you know, movies, books, anything at all, uh, even if it was like really schlocky. Uh, so, um, and, and in terms of, of sort of key influences, um, you know, like, I mean, I certainly like Star Trek because that actually shows like more of a utopian future. Like it's not like things like aren't horrible in the future. Like it was, it's like there's so many bloody post-apocalyptic futures. Like, okay, can we have one that's nice? Just, just a few. <laughs> it's like, um, so I like, like, like that about Star Trek, um, and uh, you know, in terms of some sort of uh, key key books and movies. I mean, obviously Star Wars. Like Star Wars was the first movie I ever saw, so obviously that's going to be fairly influential. Uh, it's like I never seen a movie in a theater before. It was sort of like just played it on loop for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was like super great, um, and. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then in terms of books, uh, I mean, Lord of the Rings is probably my favorite book. Um, it's, it's not really sci-fi. In fact, like, oddly enough, like, J.R.R. Tolkien is kind of anti-technology. Sci-fi and it's, fantasy are often, like, bad fellows, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is, but, it, it, like, um, it's, um, it's funny, like, Lord of the Rings is an awesome book, but it's kind of anti-technology. Um, it's still great. Um, and uh, uh, but I think... Like the Foundation series from Asimov is like a really like one of the best ever, um, and um, you know the the books you know Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein. You know those are like sort of the probably the three 
best sci-fi authors. Um, and recently somebody was recommending to me that Ian Banks' novels um, as being you know, fairly good. Um, yeah, what, what do you think is good? Um, uh, one of my uh, favorite books is, um, let's see, uh, The Moon is a Harsh mis Mistress. Yeah, it's by funny you should mention that. Yeah, like the like, I think that's Heinlein's best book, honestly. Yeah. Um, it's really it's, fun. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Perhaps we could take the last question. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Our last question. Hi. Um, uh, um, my name is Ellie Simonson. I'm a sophomore here in Core 16. Um, I was just wondering, so I know that NASA is working on the SLS, um, which I believe after a couple iterations or several iterations, they're hoping we'll be able to land on Mars. And so I'm wondering if that happens before um, you guys develop a rocket that can do that, how will that change your um, focus at SpaceX? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't think uh, that, it, I mean, our behavior is going to, we're just going to keep trying to make uh, rocket technology better and better. Um, and um, I mean, I think the time frame for the SLS, you know, sending people to Mars is pretty, pretty far out there. Um, so, uh, and, and if it does, that's great. Um, but it, it's really, it, it's, you know, what we need is, a technology system that's capable of sending large numbers of people and cargo to Mars. Um, it's it, it's it's cool to send you know one mission, sure, but that's not the thing that changes humanity's future. The thing that really matters is being able to establish a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. And and for that, um, I, I don't I don't see anything ex being done except SpaceX, honestly. Um, and and that's not to say SpaceX will be successful. But I don't see anyone even trying. So. Thanks. Okay, Elon. Thank you very All much. Right, you. I like. Thank you very much for sharing your time and thoughts with us. Uh, we love to have you back anytime at MIT. Thank All you. Right. Thank Once you. Again. Thanks. All Thank right. you so much. Thank you.